Well, I'm in the Guinness Book of World Records, believe it or not, for, at least I was, I don't think anyone has broken my record, but I was in uh, the Guinness Book of World Records for uh, winning the most national women's epee championship. I won them four years in a row. And also in my final year, 1984, I won the fourth uh, national women's epee championship. And that same year I won the national women's foil national championship, which put me as number one on the U.S. women's uh, Olympic team. In 86, I started training again and uh, fenced in FA competitions and made the first recognized international team for women's FA, and that was the 1987 Pan Am Games. And there I took the bronze medal in women's FA. When I was uh, training for the 1984 Olympics, I was living in San Antonio, Texas. And San Antonio, Texas was the center of U.S. modern pentathlon. U.S. modern pentathlon is an Olympic sport, which is riding, running, fencing, swimming, and shooting. Fencing is one-touch epee. The only place I had to train for foil was uh, at the U.S. modern pentathlon training sound. And I took foil lessons uh, with the fencing coach there, Kai Zarnecki, and where he was this big, strong guy, and all he did was give big, strong epee lessons, but, but he put a foil in his hand for me. <laughs> and, um, and then I fenced epee with his big, strong pentathletes. And uh, then when I fenced foil, it really helped me because it made me, uh, you know, think one touch, even in foil. You know what I mean? I knew how to get one touch in foil. And uh, it made me very, very, very tough, physically tough, because I was up against uh, these big athletes, these male athletes. And I say male because women had just been recognized also in that sport. Uh, and I had to put up with a lot of misogyny. I, I had uh, some, a couple of the pentathletes would literally physically unhook women and, you know, remove them from the strip because they wanted to be on the strip. Um, I had uh, some of those men who did not like it when I beat them. And so uh, they would uh, actually physically, you know, try to hurt me. And I mean, it just made me tough as nails. I'm not advocating for that behavior. And not all of the men were that way. A lot of those men I trained with, you know, we worked together well and, uh, uh, you know, I give them a lot of credit for helping me. But there were enough of them that were misogynists that, uh, you know, I had to like really, you know, toughen up. What kept me going when uh, I was being abused or ill-treated was because I wanted to make the Olympic team. <laughs> I was there to train. I uh, had a goal. I had a job to do. And I wasn't going to let that stop me. So I just, I turned it into, okay, I'm going to make it, let it make me tough. And once again, I want to emphasize that there were plenty of men uh, that I trained with that were helpful, that were encouraging. Um, it's always exciting to travel and to see a different part of the world and fence in a different gym. You know, every gym smells different. <laughs> the problem with travel, like a lot of times, we were on a shoestring budget. And so the food we ate wasn't really all that great. 1983, uh, Pan Am Games was Caracas, Venezuela. <clears throat> you had to stay where they put you and then you had to eat the food that they serve you. So, you know, uh, it was uh, refried beans and bread 
and fruit for breakfast and refried beans and bread and fruit for lunch and refried beans and bread. And you might get a piece of meat and fruit for dinner. Kind of, you know what I mean? So I thought first, well, it's not gonna be very exciting. I've been to LA before. But then when I got there and I saw how they set up the uh, Athlete Village, I was quite excited because they had one little building if you wanted Mexican food, another little building if you wanted uh, Italian food. If you wanted a steak and potato, you would go right up to the grill, pick out your steak, give it to the cook, the chef, tell him how you wanted it cooked. It was really nice because we had good food. We had a variety of food. The bad thing was uh, we didn't get to travel internationally. Um, I think I felt a lot of pressure. I felt a tremendous amount of pressure. Um, I don't think um, our team was prepared to handle the pressure. You know, that was back in the old days where you made the team by fencing in the United States. And you might get to travel once a year to fence internationally. So you didn't really have enough international experience to deal with that level of pressure. The way a lot of people got it was they paid for it themselves. But I didn't, well, you know, people would go live in Europe and go train at Tauber Bischofstein and, and, but I didn't have that kind of money. The way our coaches were selected, was, you know, there was no long-term working with a coach. Strip side coaching was horrible back in those days. I just think our team was pretty ill-prepared overall, even though that was the year that Peter Westbrook took, you know, the bronze medal. That was the exception. I see our athletes now are very much prepared for what they're going to come up against. And they have the training one thing uh, that I think has changed is that we've gotten national coaches. And uh, although I know there are some problems with that, but still you have some consistency. We also are sending people to more international competitions. So they're getting more of experience. You, you know, you just can't walk into the Olympics and go, oh, I got this down pat. You have, you know, you, you, you got to go to world teams and I mean, world cups and world championships and it, a, lo a lot of that before it becomes everyday stuff to you. Well, actually my whole experience as an athlete has uh, inspired me to become a coach. I love the sport so much, you know, and I made it my life. So when I stopped being an athlete, I was kind of like, well, what do I do with all this? Well, coaching is a natural thing. And plus I had always been an athlete and loved PE class. I loved PE class my whole life. I just wanted to move. Um, I was denied the opportunity uh, to have quality PE because I was a girl. I was denied opportunity to have sport in school because I was a girl. I was denied a lot of opportunity in fencing because I was a girl. And I just thought, you know, I don't, I, I don't want other girls to uh, have to go through what I went through. I want other girls to have uh, opportunity. And one way I can do that is to be a PE teacher, which I did become, and to be a, a fencing coach, which I did become, yeah. As I started to pursue it, I started to learn things about fencing that I never learned. For example, the tactical wheel. I made it all the way through the Olympics and into the Pan Am teams for Epe, and I never knew about the tactical wheel. And uh, as I'm learning to be a coach and I learned about the tactical wheel, I just went, what? It's, it's so beautiful, it's so simple. And if I could have had those words and understood the tactical wheel while I was fencing, boy, my life could have been a lot easier. That made me want to really get into coaching education. For many years, I worked at the USA Fencing Coaches College, like 10, 12 years. At the end, I was the 
co-director with Alex Beganay. From there, I moved to the United States Fencing Coaches Association. When the Coaches College was uh, went defunct, it was up to USFCA to pick up the education part. They always did the testing and certification part. Our coaches don't have easy access to uh, coaching education. I'm really the most proud of the fact that I, I broke down some barriers and was part of a group of women who opened the doors for women in Epe. Back in those days, oh, women can't fence Epe. Oh, women and Saber, are you kidding? That's ridiculous. Look how stupid they look. You know, and no, I'm not kidding. Uh, People would come up to me and say, oh, they're, they're nerds, they're geeks, they can't fence, Me, the meanest stuff. <laughs> and I went over to Fence Epe and then, and because I was already respected in foil, that respect came with me and suddenly people were shutting up. But also I did take a little crap too. But anyway, um, I'm very, very proud that I was part of that group of women who, uh, you know, the beginning to, that flung up in the doors for women in Epe, which led to the acceptance of Women's Saber. I uh, received a letter from USA Fencing President at that time asking what my opinion was uh, about it, recognizing Women's Saber at the Nationals that year. Uh, and, and it was sincere. But I just thought to myself, duh. <laughs> anyway, I wrote and you know, I contacted the president and I told him that I thought it would do just fine. And uh, a lot of other people did too, so he went, uh, went ahead with it. I haven't produced anybody famous, but I've produced a lot of people who are still involved in fencing and or still involved in my life. So I know that I've had a powerful effect on people that I've coached uh, because of that. The other thing that I'm really proud of is w the people that I've touched in coaching education. I think because I am an educator, I come to the gymnasium with the educator mindset, not the win you know, hit them hard. You, you know what I mean? A lot of, um, we take some of our great coaches and say, go teach. Well, they start teaching with that mindset. Um, but I, I come to the gymnasium with an educator's mindset and I've encouraged a lot of coaches. My words of wisdom, if you want to be a world-class athlete, you have to go in increments. Start at the local level and you do well there, then you do well at the regional level, then you do well at the national level, then you start traveling internationally. But uh, you have to study. Some people are very lucky and they have a coach that's knowledgeable and teaches them. Some people might have to do a little study on their own on the side. You know, knowledge is mightier than the sword, right? No, it's the pen is mightier than the sword, which that's very close. <laughs> no, but you have to work hard. Okay, you've got to work physically hard. No, I'm not kidding. Uh, you need to have a really great coach. Uh, you need to know the more knowledge you have, the better. And you have to travel internationally. You have to fence in those international competitions. Uh, several coaches who have influenced and inspired me. The uh, number one coach was Michael DeSaro. Michael DeSaro <laughs> was my coach in college and he was a great, great technician. And that's why I didn't have the tactical knowledge. Michael taught me techni technique, perfect technique. Every lesson was about perfect technique and conditioning because he would like over and 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 over until it was perfect. I know good technique now. I mean, I really know it. I know how to teach it. I used to know how to do it. So I'm grateful for that and I'm grateful for his passion and many things he taught me outside of fencing and you know, life lessons and whatever. But it's Professor Tchaikovsky from Poland 
When he came to the United States, I believe in 1990, for our very first international coaching seminar was when I met him. And he blew my mind. He is truly Professor Tchaikovsky. And I recommend everyone read his works, which are available. Uh, there's a couple of books. He was the head of the Polish Physical Education School's fencing program. He makes fencing pretty easy to understand if, once you start thinking about it the way he does. For example, he says there's only two things that happen in fencing. The referee says, ready, fence. And the fencers are jumping around and they're hitting blades and jumping, moving back and forth. Okay, and then somebody goes and scores a touch. Two things were happening there. One was preparation. All this jumping around was preparation. And this final action was the real action. Or in other words, the ultimate action. So you can kind of think about fencing like that. People are going to, the referee's going to say, ready, fence. And these two people, they're going to, you know, dance back and forth, trying to figure out what to do, trying to get into the right distance, trying to figure out the right time. That's all called preparation, preparation. And then, boom, somebody's going to score a touch. That's the ultimate action. I'm like, yeah, well, that's pretty simple. We're doing preparation, and I... I can do this. I can do a little half lunge, see what you're going to do. Little false attack, see what you're going to do. This is all preparation. Now I'm going to do a real attack, okay? So now I'm going to attempt to do a real action, but a ho ho, you are ready for me and you parry me. You are doing a real action because you are really trying to defend yourself. Okay. And now, by God, you got me. So you're going to do another real action and I'm going to go, oh, no, you're not. So when you are really trying to score or really trying to defend, you are doing preparation. I mean, I'm sorry, you're doing the ultimate action. Everything else is preparation. And when you think about it, well, I'm like, well, what else could there be? Of course, then he gets, you know, he gets much, 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 much deeper. But if you start there and you just simply break it down, then you go, okay, I'm just going to think about the preparation part. Okay. Then you can start with the breaking down the prep. Well, how many different kinds of preparation are there? How many different ways of preparing are there? Okay. Then I can come over here and I can think about the real actions. Well, how many, what, what are the real actions? Then he breaks it down and breaks it down and breaks it down. And, and if you just follow his logic, he, it becomes simpler and simpler. I strongly encourage women coaches to take the route of study and certification. Study, read, take some zoom clinics if possible go to a face-to-face -face clinic and pursue your certification um, there's something really special about having that plaque on the wall and uh, women if you look at the data there's lots of women who are assistant monitors and monitors and very very few women go above that uh, and that's because women have systematically been kept out historically. I don't want to go into that. You can watch my TED talk. Women have got to now go for their certification. And I understand that some women are intimidated or deliberately have been intimidated by men. Any woman who wants to get her certification, she can come directly to me. I will mentor her and uh, help her move up to the next level. Mm -hmm.